Good evening, everyone. I'm Deepika, and on behalf of the team at the archives at NCBS, I'd like to extend a really warm welcome to everyone here today um, with us at this very special event, the 56th edition of the Archives Public Lecture Series. Um, many of you know, uh, know us already, and it's great to see old as well as new faces here. Um, the Archives at NCBS is a public collecting center for the history of science in contemporary India. We house over 100,000 processed papers, photographs, equipment, recordings, and more. Um, when this event is done, it would be great if you would like to drop by the archives and look around um, to get there. You just have to step outside this door, go around the corner, and go one floor down to the, to the basement. That's where we're located. You can also find us online uh, on archives.ncbs.res.in. And as part of this lecture series, we have talks by individuals based on their vast body of work and service. These talks are framed around their explorations in and around archives, and more broadly around the history of ideas. The series has included discussions by artists, archivists, academicians, lawyers, teachers, journalists, and more. And for this lecture, which is the 56th of the series, we are so deeply honored to have with us Uma Chakravarti. Uma Chakravarti is a distinguished feminist historian who has taught at Miranda House College for Women uh, at Delhi University for over 30 years. Her writing spans an incredibly wide range from Buddhism, early Indian history, the 19th century, to contemporary issues. She has authored several publications and directed four documentary films. Yeah. <laughs> Seven <laughs> documentary films, I'm sorry. That's Central Women. She is also closely in, involved with the women's movement as well as the movement for democratic rights in India and has been part of fact finding teams to investigate human rights violations, communal violence, and state repression. And just yesterday at the informal session at the archives, Uma was telling us about her important work in creating oral histories, documenting the violent attacks on Sikhs in 1984. And I can go on for ages, but nothing will really be sufficient to capture Uma's rich body of work. So I'll stop here and say that Uma will be speaking to us today about the dying lineage, gender, social history, and the Mahabharata. Uh, just by way of, um, uh, uh, by way of uh, uh, itty bitty tidbits that go into the making of uh, more serious stuff. Um, this is a piece of work that I began, I think in 2008. Um, and I worked on it in bits and pieces, depending upon access to library, other, other things that, uh, compulsions that I had to uh, face and write about. And so this manuscript, kind of half, uh, half or uh, two thirds written, uh, lay around for a while. And then something, uh, the pandemic actually uh, hit us. And I, 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 unfortunately we lost a few people who were around us, historians and so on. And it suddenly occurred to me that I need to finish this piece of work because if I were to drop, drop dead uh, suddenly because of the corona, <laughs> nobody else would be able to finish this book because it's only in my head. And because it's in my head, only I have to do it, you know, so at the end of the day. So that gave me the shock of my life. And then I sat down and I actually had to write only 30 pages more, but it had, it had been stored for so many years because I never got down to it. And I'm glad that I got through the corona without uh, dropping dead or even getting it seriously. Uh, but uh, I am also glad that it uh, jolted me into finishing because now it's done and there is an argument over here and it's something that has been uh, in my, um, uh, in the work that I did, in the reading that I did, uh, and finally in the writing up that I uh, wrote up. Uh, in, in the, the manuscript that I completed. Um, it's sort of, it's a work that has, in a sense, um, come as accumulation, accumulation, uh, or at the end of a process of trying to write gender into history. And I've actually been someone who's tried to bring gender into history in a variety of ways, in writing, in writing on the on the past, in serious writing, in contemporary writing, in questions of impunity, in questions of sexual violence, and in, um, in a variety of ways that all my films, which actually are part of my archiving also, uh, are centered on women. Uh, and that extent, um, uh, I've 
trying to um, bring into center, into the center, and not only into the center, but to actually reconceptualize the way we think about the past by making women integral to it. Now, this needs to be done not only from the point of view of uh, gender, it needs to be done from the point of view of other uh, sections that have been left out of the focus of history. Uh, you all know that basically history has been the story of people, men cutting off the heads, their, each other's heads in order to get to power. And that's the kind of history that we were stuck with when we were young. Um, and even when we tried to change it, it didn't really move that much. Um, gender remained something which was um, something that was difficult to put into the framework of history because of its focus on uh, narrowly political power. And since women hadn't really wielded political power except as you know, Jansi Kiramani type of things, we never actually uh, got a sense of gender as an element and a, as an aspect of human existence <laughs> and of the way in which history had unfolded. So it's a, it's a, it's a big, huge missing gap. Um, that's what uh, led me to, uh, to sort of come to uh, writing this more seriously. And I have been the starting point of this exercise. That I've been a little bit, not only a little bit, but seriously unhappy with the idea that you bring women in, in this what came to be called Add Women and Stir. So you, you know, you're talking about uh, peasant movements, this, that, and the other, and then you'll, you'll say, bring in a little, say, five pages or whatever it is on women. But it doesn't actually, women are not integral to the way in which you think about and conceptualize the, even the movement that you're studying. So at the end of the day, that uh, Add Women and Stir approach was deeply, deeply frustrating, uh, but it was also get out of. Um, and then I got invited in, in the usual style. Um, I got invited to a conference in uh, in JNU, that bad JNU where everybody is very wicked uh, <laughs> and they're you know, taking you off in different directions. Um, and it was on transitions. Now, I don't know how many of you are historians, but transitions is this great thing in history, you know, the transition from this to that, from price movements leading to transition, something else leading to transition. And the uh, conference was in, I think, in 2006 or seven. And in the usual style that um, uh, had begun to happen by that time, I got asked to come and do the gend gendering the transitions idea. I said, what is this? Firstly, I was irritated by the fact that nobody's asking me to do social history, but they're telling me to come and do gender, gender the transition debate, huh? or gender, put gender into this. And I was quite irritated. But then I thought to myself, how can I even do gender? How am I going to gender the price movements? How am I going to gender, you know, sort of something else, which is like a huge uh, transformation in history? Uh, I don't have the resources. I don't have the, the prior writing. Uh, the archive doesn't exist and so on. And then it occurred to me that, yes, well, there is one time when gender is critical in actually moving to a new social dynamic or, or is, is a critical element. And that's the point at which women's sexuality comes to be seen as a resource. And then it is, there is a process by which it is, um, it is uh, let's say, um, sought to be um, uh, brought into the framework, uh, into um, the unfolding uh, emergence of inequalities. And it's very early in time. We don't even normally won't even be able to uh, sort of access that moment. But I thought to myself, that's the only time when they moved history in a certain kind of way. And that's the point at which women's sexuality came under the control of the community essentially led by men. And that is the point at which they, there is a way in which all other inequalities also come into being and they tend to shape each other. So I thought to myself, this is the moment uh, that yes, maybe you can do it. And it's a very early time. We don't have the rich resources, uh, archival resources that say for instance, Mesopotamia has and which Gordon and have worked on very well. Uh, there's nothing like that over here. But I did consider then, then I was struck by my general interest in the Mahabharata, which 
congealed around this question. So basically what I'm going to do today is to tell you, is, is to do my own reading of the Mahabharata in which the politics of reproduction is central to the narrative, even though it may not actually be regarded as central to the narrative, and it may not even be seen, and it never features as an important question, uh, which the men raise and debate. So essentially, uh, I'm going to uh, do the use the Mahabharata. Now, I've written a, a fair amount on the epics. The Mahabharata is a, is a, is a very, very rich and complex and going in all kinds of directions sort of text. And so it makes for extremely rich uh, analytical uh, material. So it, it's the Mahabharata that I'm focused on. And I will look at uh, the question of uh, how a new formation, uh, also what are the dynamics and say for instructing a lineage and how central um, marriage and reproduction is to that. Everyone knows how central marriage and reproduction is to history generally, but also to, uh, particularly in the context of Mahabharata, people will know that. Um, so this is what I wanted to do. Now, I found two, two earlier pieces of writing that were very important in shaping my writing, and that was my thinking around it. One was Kumkum Roy's a very classic study, a very strongly ideological uh, sort of uh, text, which was the the um, the literature around sacrifices, which and in which he used in order to study the emergence of monarchy in northern India, and so she was looking at a political institution, the emergence of it, but she made a breakthrough which completely threw out this. Uh, and women and stir approach because gender was central to her analytical uh, gaze. So she, she was able to show you how, as the uh, monarchy emerged, the monarchy was actually controlling uh, the resources, the productive and the reproductive resources. Now that's very important for us. We've, uh, all our focus has been on productive resources, but we don't really look at reproductive resources. And reproduction is a resource, uh, which is why it's so central, uh, which, which is why it's so necessary to control. So her um, uh, analysis was very, was very marvelous in that it looked at the sacrifices of the great, the great, the great sacrifices that the kings performed uh, in order to look at the manner in which stratification emerged and monarchy and caste and uh, that is Varna and um, and gender stratification comes at the same time. And she looks at it from the point of view of the realm, and then she also looks at it from the point of view of the household, because so many of the rituals are around the household. So what it's doing, what these rituals are doing is to legitimate the right of the king to appropriate the resources, productive and reproductive resources of the kingdom, and the right of the yajamana, that is the, 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 the head of the household man, uh, which uh, uh, it controls the productive and reproductive resources of the household. So that uh, that mode of uh, of um, looking at a text which nobody else would have looked at from that point of view, they would have just seen it as a series of sacrifices, was in a sense a breakthrough from the point of view that take the uh, fact that the same text could yield a very sensitive gendered history if only you had both the patience <laughs> and the skill to be able to read those texts in a certain kind of way. So that's, that's some background. One of the uh, other things that I'd like to do, I mean, I know I have a time bound issue, so I better put this thing uh, on and uh, I'll, I'll try and not go into detail, but give you the broad outlines of what I was, have been doing. Um, but if it's getting to be too long, please, Please give me a, uh, an alert. I'm sort of used to a 50-minute schedule, having been a teacher for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But uh, but <laughs> I might over overshoot that. Other ideas I think I, I I'd like to mention, which are important, uh, is um, a concept or a uh, or an analytical mode. Of, uh, let's say. Uh, um, Putting together by young younger feminist 
Pratiksha Bakshin, whose work some of you might know, um, as, uh, which is around sexual violence. Um, she came up at some point in the long discussions that we've been having over the years. Uh, you know, we talk about sexual control, we talk about uh, a series of other things, but she actually came up with something which I think is very useful and she called it sexual governance. And that allows us to look at the, the structure by which you can enter the questions of sexuality and gender without us looking at it as necessarily this, you know, the narrow part of it. So I find sexual governance very important. That's going to be uh, a running way in which my entry into the uh, discussion today is, is going to go. Uh, the other the other issue that I find was critical, has always become critical to me, is this idea of class. Now, I know you, most of you will never have heard of it. But it's, a, it's a phrase that uh, some young student in JNU um, uh, coined, but I find it captures the particular dynamic of Indian social reality very well. It's a combination of class and caste. In India, you cannot separate class from caste. So, so class brings that together marvelously because the difference between class and caste is simply the in perpetuity that you create. So this term is very powerful for me in understanding the way in which a structure comes into place and then it becomes the grid on which the rest of society get, hinges. So class is a very important concept uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it leads to, and then we need to think about the fact that there have been stable structures of reproducing inequality in South Asia, which are drawn from this combination of the control, the bringing together of caste and gender. I, uh, I mean, I'm sort of a bit hysterical about this and I keep uh, uh, emphasizing it, but I think it's important for us to not separate caste, class and gender. Actually, it's the package uh, that forms the basis of inequality and reproduces it into the next generation. So these are ideas that I, I work with. I also would like to finally end with one thing and the idea of dystopia in, uh, in our mythology, in our, in our <clears throat> writing uh, of the Shastrik and the Sutra literature and so on, the idea of a dystopia, which is the Kali Yuga. Everyone knows that we, we, in a very common sense way, we say Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga, uh, Kali Yuga has come, or whatever it is. But Kali Yuga is a, is a is a mode of talking about the, it's the opposite of utopia. It's a dystopia and it's the time when everything has gone awry and rampant. And that's actually uh, a very important way in which you understand how um, society looks at things that might actually affect the idea of the stable structure that have come into place. So to that extent, I think, uh, the idea of a dystopia is also important for me as far as the line of inquiry is concerned. Okay, now why the Mahabharata? Partly, uh, uh, you know, the Mahabharata is, a, is an amazing text because it is, it's less like, I mean, it's an epic, just like the Ramayana, but the Ramayana is, is formed as an ideological uh, coherent whole. It's meant to talk about ideal types. Uh, the ideal kingdom, the ideal king, the ideal wife, the ideal brother, the ideal everything. Whereas uh, the problem with the Mahabharata is that the ideal type doesn't exist. And it's always been um, sort of pummeled around and beaten up by the fact that actually in, in life, things, is go things are going in completely different directions. So it's, it's a much more interesting text from the point of view, looking at the uh, leakages in uh, the, the, in the in creating the ideal type at all. And so, um, so the Mahabharata, but it's also a time, uh, historically, I mean, you know, there's all this debate about 4,000 years ago, 800 years ago, whatever it is, eight, no, uh, 800 BC, 4,000 BC, all kinds of dates you'll get, all of which is irrelevant, as far as I'm concerned. The critical thing is that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's at a time when, um, uh, actually, king, older, smaller king, uh, clan king, clan units are becoming kingdoms and land is becoming an important resource. We must remember that the whole battle is around the tension over, uh, over land, which is the two fratres, the uh, fighting 
uh, clans are, or uh, cousins are really, it's all about the kingdom and the kingdom is really about uh, the control over the land. And the, uh, the wider context you'll see is, is this. So um, um, it's also, uh, but we should also remember that the, the Mahabharata is especially, both actually Mahabharata and the Ramayana are about really centered around kingdoms and kingship and kingly communities, which means it's really, it's a, it's a gaze into the Kshatriyas as a category of people rather than uh, with other sections of society. So that, that's, uh, that's an important thing. Now, when you come to the uh, starting to look at the story uh, or look at the lines of analysis that I want to uh, probe, there's this question of was there, for me, the most striking thing, was there an orderly succession of the transfer or orderly uh, organization of the transfer of women's sexuality and the control over women. So uh, the, the important question is, um, you know, uh, anthropologists and others have actually told you about how marriage comes to exist, comes into existence, what it does in terms of uh, creating orderly systems of the transfer of women to, from one family to another, from one clan to another, from whatever it is. And so this is what uh, leads to, but it's, it has to be done in an orderly fashion because otherwise it will be free for all and people will be plundering and you know, doing whatever they like. And of course, which they do from time to time when the breakdown happens, but there is an attempt to put an orderly system into place. And that's what marriage is about. Marriage is about then finally organizing this orderly succession, transfer of women from one family or one clan or one community to another. Uh, now, what's interesting, and, and, and I found Gail Rubin's classic essay on the trafficking of women very, very useful from the point of view of my own uh, reading of the Mahabharata. Um, and that's something that is, uh, I'm, I'm, many of you might be familiar with that essay, but it's a classic essay and you, sh you should look at it. So I, I do owe a debt to her, as it were. Now, what's interesting in uh, the old uh, traditions, that is in the textual tradition, is two things. One is a Buddhist myth, a kind of Buddhist myth, which is called the Agnya Sutta, uh, which is what came first in, and it's a story of how the world evolved. It's out of Buddhist, it's a Dignitaya. Uh, that's very powerful because it describes how the world came into existence. Now, the point over there is that actually promiscuity, that is non-ritualized ways of transfer of women uh, by, uh, in, a, in a way organized and legitimate way from one client to another, from one person to another, is not the pattern that exists in this history that you, uh, in, is described. So the Agnya Sutta actually describes how the world came into existence, how there was no marriage to start with, but there was cohabitation. And then finally, other, you know, other um, hierarchies came into being. So that's an interesting moment. I am interested in the question of promiscuity and the fact that there is no ritualized way in which you transfer women from one group to another, organized way in which you transfer. Uh, or you also have bring in um, monogamy for women. That's also not something that you see in, uh, in, in the textual creation. Now, there's one interesting storyline which actually emerges from the Mahabharata and that is, uh, a law that is attributed to a person called Svetaketu. You know Svetaketu. Some of you will know Svetaketu. Svetaketu uh, describes a time when uh, he's very offended because some guy comes along and propositions his mother and takes her off for a little uh, assignation. Which chal rai, side me. Sorry to say it like that. But that episode is... Uh, is uh, now Sveta Ketu is the son of this woman, you know, he's really angry. I mean, what is this nonsense which they you have to get the uh, legitimate line? Uh, I'm the son, and this is some guy has come and propositioned her, taken her around, and he's quite outraged. And his father tells him, This is the old law, which is the pre the law before you put structures into place. Okay, so this way, and he says he's so offended, he said, from henceforth, the woman will only stay with one man, 
Of course, men can have more relationships, but uh, the woman must stay with only one man. So you're bringing monogamy into place for women, and that's there in the text itself. Okay, so I don't, I don't have to put it over there. It's there, and all I have to do is to notice it and tell you about it. So, uh, so that's the other thing. Now, once this happens, then uh, women's sexual agency becomes very, very suspect. So you can't grant sexual agency to women because if it's only one man you have to be uh, loyal to, then women's sexual agency will have to be kept under control. There's no question of it being uh, something that can be expressed. So um, after which, you know, everything like a, if a woman expresses desire, it disrupts the whole system. Because then, you know, so you know, I mean, the mythology tells us so much, which is, uh, which is um, interesting. So Ahilya, Ahilya is, you know, everybody knows the Ahilya story. There are half a dozen versions of it. And Indra comes in the guise of the husband. Uh, uh, in, in some, Ahilya knows that it's not her husband, but she thinks, Kya farak padta hai? Chalo, kar lete hai. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, some she doesn't know. And of course, we know how it ends because Gautama is so furious with her and he punishes her. She becomes a stone. We all know that. She became a stone and the Brahma kicked her, I mean, touched her, uh, the stone, and she became, came back to life. So, this punishment of the woman who has the gaze, you look outside of the thing and you are, uh, you are to be punished for it. And there's similarly Renuka. I mean, poor thing, she just, you know, she, uh, she's, uh, she's been married, she's had five children, and uh, she carries, um, she goes to the river every morning, and she molds wet mud with the water, and in that she brings, because, because of the power of her chastity, she's able to bring water back for her husband's ablutions, uh, back in the thing. Now, one day she sees a Gandharva flying over the, uh, and the, Uska, sirf, he only, um, his uh, shadow falls on the, uh, on the water. <laughs> and she says how handsome he is. That's all she does <laughs> uh, in, in one storyline. And bus, now she's lost her power and the water will not stay in that mud, okay, in that wet mud. So she comes back and of course the, the, her uh, husband knows that she's, she's, she's not been faithful, she's been unchaste. And then he tells his sons, cut off her head. One, two, three, four. He has five sons. Four of the sons refuse to do it. Parshurama, who is the youngest and who is known to be cut her off head, cut her off of head, <laughs> if I may say so, he, he, he finally, he's the youngest, he obliges. He cuts off, he's very, un, he's also unhappy. He cuts off her head. Uh, so she's punished for the days. She's basically punished for even the disloyalty of the so matlab, she's, she's sinned in, even in her mind. So now this, uh, this, is, this background is just simply to <laughs> give you an idea of where my analysis is going. Now, there are many great questions in the Mahabharata, and they are regarded as very powerful moral questions. Okay, so um, Yudhishthira questions the rationale for, marriage, uh, for, uh, for the state. Arjuna questions the Kshatriya's duty to fight. You know, in the famous episode where he says, do I have to fight my relatives and so on? Um, so there's a question. Janaka questions, he's king, and he questions worldly life. Why should, why should I be doing worldly life? Why should I be going in some other direction? These three questions are there. And the fourth question, Shweta Ketu uh, questions the origins of marriage. I mean, he's questioning the promiscuity that existed before. So there are four great moral questions in the Mahabharata. What is significant is that only these are regarded as the four great questions that the Mahabharata uh, uh, poses. Now, my whole analysis is going to be around the abduction of women. Okay, if you have orderly succession, where, how does, how do you how, orderly transfer and of women to uh, organized men handing over women to other men? How do we see questions of abduction? And abductions are very powerful, very central in the Mahabharata narrative. There's a lot of abduction going on, okay? So why do questions like the abduction, and, and you all know the most famous story is the abduction of Amba. She's abducted and then she is 
there's no use for it. Nobody has any use for her. And then she goes from place to place trying to think. And then you all know the story. And everyone now, because it's trendy to know about uh, the, 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 let's say, the shading of the uh, sexualities, it's, it's, we all know Amba's story as someone who then was reborn. She was so angry. She was reborn as a man. And then she had to, she took her own revenge. But the original abduction, nobody's paying any attention to. Why was she abducted at all? And where was she abducted from? She and her two sisters are in the, uh, in a swamvara. A swamvara is a place where you're supposed to choose. These kings are all assembled around you and you make the choice and you say, okay, you garland, supposedly, and those of us who are very uh, interested in saying we always had it, we, we had everything in the past, we'll also turn around and say, look, we had uh, Swayamvaras in the past, there was, there was agency, women had whatever it is, true. But the fact is that what is significant is that why is, why does Amba and she and her two sisters, Ambika and Ambalika, why do they get abducted and they get abducted from the, from the Swamvara? And who's abducting them? Mr. Bishma. And why is he abducting them? Not for himself. Because he's, he's chased. He can't, he's sworn that he's never going to have. Uh, um, he is not going to reproduce. He's not going to be a claimant for the throne. So as far as he's concerned, he's not doing it for himself. But not one, not two, three women for that one brother of his, uh, who is the sole repository of the reproduction for the next generation. I was like, Dark, give me this one. Dark, Marai, Marai, Marai. I just go, Bachana, I just go. So the abduction, so you're bringing back three women. And these three women are now, of all this, we don't get to the storyline of the other two, but actually, um, Amba's story is important. Now, the question that is raised is if Marilyn, uh, uh, why is it that the um, Amba story does not become a moral question for the Mahara? That's my question, and that should be our question. Why is it that only some things are regarded as mor great moral questions of their time? This is not considered to be a moral question. And we know what happened to Amba. You all know how uh, she suffers the consequences because uh, she's been physically lifted and put on this chariot as have been Ambika and Ambarika. Touch is considered perfectly, you know, very, very wrong. You, we know that. And at the end of the day, um, the uh, Bhishma is not, and he's not even the, going to be the partner at the end. He's carried them away for this girl. And then he discovers later on, he's told that she's, uh, she, um, Amba tells him that I'm promised. I'm already, uh, I've promised, I'm, I am uh, in a relationship with, I mean, she wants to marry Shalya. So the whole point is that uh, the, um, and then he says, okay, I don't want you. Who's going to keep a woman who's like a poisonous snake in my house? Off you go, you can go back. But she will not be taken back by the, uh, the by the man in her life also. So she's stuck with it. Now, this is a moral question. Why was Amba not allowed to go through with the Swamara and choose the partner for herself? Equally the other two, but the other two uh, we don't get to know because they are a little bit like cardboard copies of, uh, of her. So I think that um, given that uh, uh, in the making of lineages, marriage and reproduction are really, really critical elements in, in the perpetuation of the lineage. How is it that we, while there are so many forms of marriage, we're very good at the fact that we'll give you multiple choice, okay? So we uh, eight forms of marriage hai, uh, hierarchy of, uh, of uh, communities hai, castes hai. So we are good at the diversity model. But, uh, uh, but why is it that in these eight forms of marriage, in which interestingly, Swamara does not feature as a form of marriage, but it is considered to be a practice amongst the kingly dynasties. And we know that almost everybody chose their partners. I mean, Draupadi gets uh, Arjuna in a competition in a Swamvara. Uh, similarly, there are others and so on. So the Swamvara is regarded as something that is legitimate for the Kshatriyas. Um, it is not featuring as one of the eight forms of marriage. But what are you doing 
in a, the form of marriage which Bhishma has um, uh, taken recourse to, it's a form of marriage which is called Rakshasa. The, the Swayamvara is therefore the structural counterpart of the Rakshasa. Because in Swayamvara there is agency of women. Rakshasa is you grab the woman and take off. Okay. So actually denying choice. So one is supposed to be choice and one is uh, no choice. But you are picking her up, not from her house, not from anywhere else, but from the very Swayamvara. And then you're you know, very heroic because you fought all the other kings and they say, how dare you and all the rest of it. Bhishma's uh, stock goes up on, on top. Uh, but the fact of the matter is he's grabbed these three princesses and taken them away and they're not for him. And then Amba's story is that she goes, uh, she goes back and forth, back and forth. And she, finally she tells him, you and others also tell him that you have Grab, you have picked her up, you have abducted her. So, you have to do it with her. But, no, we have to do it with her. We will never do it with her. But, how is he taking it out? He's actually uh, punishing Amba for his, uh, for, for, for his uh, vow. We all admire him for it. Okay? Here's this man who gave up. But he's also, to my mind, I don't think he ever gets over the fact that he's forced to accept that choice. There's no, and why is he doing it? Because his father's aging sexuality determines that usko, usko satyamati achhi lag gayi uske baad. So chalo, uh, I will, I will be the sacrificing son. I, and they're saying that she won't marry you unless you give up the throne. And he says, I'll give up the throne. And so he, I mean, the man is forced to be someone who he is not. And the entire crisis of the reproduction of the lineage is coming from the Bhishma not being able to marry and reproduce. It's, so then you are left with this young boy, Mr. Vichitra who is, uh, gets now these three princesses, one who has to be sent back because she's not safe to keep. She's like the snake. Uh, then the other two are left. And then but at the end of the day, they can't reproduce. Even the, the, there's, there are, there's no child that comes along. Now, this uh, abduction then has to be seen quite seriously as uh, a mode of acquiring wives for a dying lineage. It's a dying lineage. Because if Vichitra Virya does not reproduce, that lineage is finished. Bhishma has sworn he will not have, uh, not reproduce. So ultimately that lineage will die. So the end, that dynasty is going to die because of Vichitra being a very young person and not having whatever it is. And unfortunately for him, uh, even though he, Amba goes away and he has these two wives, he doesn't successfully reproduce. In many years of happy married life, supposedly, but he doesn't reproduce. Now you are back to the crisis again. And the crisis comes to, uh, now this question is, okay, uh, what shall we do? Because now their lineage is definitely going to die because Vichitra Maria dies. Now what do you want to do? So when you have levirate, levirate is a form of, uh, of uh, reprodu reproducing in which the brother-in-law the husband's brother uh, is the leverate partner who provides you with the, 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 um, the offspring, the next generation. But we are in a crisis because Mr. Bhishma will not reproduce, he will not, whatever it is. So then we are back to a, a crisis mode. So then you come up with this Satyavati, she's a cool cat. You know, I say it to my mind. <laughs> she's quite a cool cat. Because I, there's been an earlier altercation. I don't have the time, I think, to go into all the different stories. But uh, uh, Satyavati then comes up with this little secret that she's maintained all her life, which is that Mera ek bhi aur, ek aur bachcha bhi hai. So that means there is another brother of Vichitra Vela, who has part his mother, his brother by the mother's side, not by the father's side. Okay. Vishma is the brother by the father's side, but um, this one is a mother, uh, he's, he's a brother from the mother's side, the mother's um, quote unquote unacknowledged son. And who is he? That's Vyasa. And Vyasa is the author of the 
Mahabharata, so he can do whatever he likes with the text. <laughs> 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 Actually, he gives him many twists and turns. So, uh, so there's um, and the episode. I mean, I have to collapse a lot because it's uh, uh, it's a long account. But um, so you are in a crisis now. The uh, Satyamati tells the two princesses, they are those Ambika and Ambarika. Uh, she tells Ambika, who is the older of the of the two, she says, "Tonight, your brother-in-law will come." Now. What does Ambika think? She thinks ki Bhishma ne wale hai. Because he's the only known brother-in-law. But she's going to send this other fellow, which she hasn't. So what is the consequence of that? Thing? So uh, Mr. What's it called? Vyasa comes along and Vyasa has actually put a precondition. I'm not going to do this job unless for one year these women sacrifice and do it. Satyavati says, I can't wait. I need the bachas now. Abhi chahiye mujhe. So, so <laughs> and there's no, you know, there's no none of the new technology. So at the end of the day, they are stuck with this situation in which he says, your brother-in-law is coming. And this poor Ambika thinks this handsome, uh, virile Mr. Bhishma is going to come, warrior, big, well-known warrior, he's going to come. She's quite pleased uh, that this is going to happen. But actually who turns up is Mr. Vyas, and he's like unkempt, hasn't shaved, hasn't bathed for years and years because he's undoing some aesthetics of various kinds and so on. He shows up and he is very, he has already told Satyavati, let them prepare for a year, for a year for my presence. She hasn't waited. And she's so shocked that you all know he, she closes her eyes. Now, what's the consequence of that? Poor Mr. Dhritarashtra is born without any eyes. So he's he's punished for the uh, what's it called? The dynamics of whatever is going on. So then, failed reproduction. I shall try again. Then try again. Me, uh, it goes to Ambalika. Um, now she knows he. It's not Bhishma. This other fellow is coming. She's slightly prepared, but even that is a little bit too much because she I mean, she pales at the sight of this man. Chalo, uska bhi bachcha ho jata and he is Pandu and he is pale. Now, neither of them is supposed to be ready, fit for uh, rulership. Uh, so, crisis. So, Satyavati is told, try again, try again. And then, in the last episode, you all know that uh, Ambika then decides, hey, enough's enough, Madhanika, I'm not submitting myself to this once more. And she passes off her Dasi as the um, princess, dresses her up nicely, and so on. Yasa uh, has a relationship with her. She's um, he's very pleased because she pleases him. She does everything according to the rule book, and he's and then he produces and he produces the only unflawed child in that whole sequence, and that is Vidura. And he's the dharmic king. He could have been the dharmic king, but he stayed. He's got dasi blood in him. He has no kshatriya blood. He's got he he's a half brother to these other two, but he has. He has no Kshatriya blood. So he can't be made king at the end of the day. And he occupies a lower ground position as a sort of, um, you know, hanger about of the uh, kingly um, establishment. But the tragedy is that he could actually have been the king who salvaged not only dynasty, but salvaged. So you can see caste and gender and everything is constantly being replayed in the narrative itself because it's not, the, the rules are, already fixed. So that's that's where it uh, happens. Now, I um, will not... Um, uh, uh, Amba's story, you all know, so then I'll, I'll take it from there. I think I've, have I overshot, overshot my... I'm close to overshooting. No? So I'll just end, <laughs> I'll round this up with... So, um, so this, the, the lineage is fraught. And it has... And then finally, both those children get into a, uh, um, the children of Ambika and Ambalika, Pandu and Dhritarashtra then are uh, get into a tussle between themselves. And one generation, uh, they sort it out in a certain kind of way, but the next generation is not willing to accept it. One of the things that we must understand from all this is that orderly succession in the king's household is not yet an established practice. The eldest son is always being disrupted in some way or the other. Even Bhishma, for instance, can't rule because there's a second son 
who's supposed to take charge. Similarly, in the Dashrata household also, you'll see that in the epic, Rama um, uh, should be the king, he's the eldest son, but the negotiation now that Bharata will be king. So orderly succession to the eldest son is not actually in place properly at this point of time. And it has to be rationalized and legitimated by a number of strategies. And one of the things that we get from the storyline is, uh, is, uh, uh, is that there is, it's still a period in which the rules are being made up and uh, orderly forms of ensuring that the lineage doesn't die and it's reproduced is, uh, is happening. Now, um, I will uh, um, try and uh, wind this up with, uh, the bottom line of what I've been trying to say is that in a sense, um, yeah, I, I think I want to spend two minutes on this other thing. Why is Rakshasa being practiced at all? Rakshasa is the form of marriage, which is supposed to be abduction. Why is it being practiced at all? And why are the kings being, uh, the Kshatriyas and the kingly dynast dynasties indulging in this practice? Because it seems to be very important to get in women through whom reproduction can take place. And so if there is a desperation about in some ways, then you, abduction is a choice. But why is abduction taking place from a Swamvara? So what is, a Swamvara is also supposed to be lit, only lit, it's, it's a practice. See, none of this applies to the Brahmins. Huh? They've got their own rules and their own forms of marriage. This is particular for the Kshatriyas. Why is it that um, Swamvara is only practiced by Kshatriya women, supposed to be, and why is Rakshasa allowed to Kshatriya men? Because it's low down in the hierarchy. Brahmins cannot practice it. It is only uh, available to the uh, Kshatriyas. And at the end of the day, there is a rationale for saying Kshatriyas can do this. The Rakshasa form of marriage, they can practice because the, um, because the Kshatriya gives, he doesn't ever take. You can't, uh, sorry, take, uh, he, uh, he will give to others, but he cannot be the recipient of a gift because he's powerful and he's, he's a king. And so uh, the process by which you give her, give her a, uh, give him a girl in marriage is not something that is accepted. He will not say dehi, mirko dena hai. So it is abduction almost becomes a right. Now, there's a very critical uh, one episode, which I'd just like to uh, share with you. And that is, um, you know, there are two other famous abductions in the, apart from the Amba, Amba Ambika, Ambalika story. And one of them is Arjuna. Arjuna abducts Subhadra. And finally, the dynasty is actually coming out of the abduction, ab abduction uh, style of marriage, uh, the Rakshasa form of marriage. And um, Arjuna is hesitating. Um, and, and Krishna says to him, uh, abduct her from the Swamura because we do not know whom she will choose. So actually choice has to be um, clamped. You can't give choice to women, that's autonomy. So in a sense, actually the abduction is actually, here is, and the Lord himself is telling uh, Arjuna this, abduct her because we don't know in what direction her choices will go. And that's the rationale for, uh, for abduction. So actually the Swamvara and, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Rakshasa are structural antagonists to each other. You know, and you can't, they're, they're pitted against each other in the sense of as forms, because one means choice and the other is actually the clamping down of choice. So in that sense also, it's interesting that even though you may have these eight forms of marriage, other ways of doing, uh, and one has not spent too much time with the Shakuntala, the only episode, only thing that I'd like to say in her case is that she has a Gandharva marriage. And there is a problem with Gandharva marriages. Gandharva also is allowed only to <coughs> Kshatriyas. Uh, and there's a problem with Gandharva marriages because there are no witnesses. And if there are no witnesses, then the king can turn around and say, who are you? Acha? I have something to do with you. Not really, you know. And that, and Shakuntala has to tell him 
how important it is for a king to have a son and how important it is for people to have sons and so on. And that's a, and she has to threaten him with a shattered head. You know, if, you're, uh, if you don't uphold your own honor word, then your head will split, it, split into pieces. She has to do all that in order to have her son accepted. And it's all coming out of the fact that there are no witnesses in a Gandhava marriage. And there's a desperation to have that consummate that relationship and move on as, uh, as uh, practiced by the Shanta. So if you look at all the storylines and the forms of marriage that they are uh, dealing with, then if they, there's a range of uh, ways in which reproduction has been uh, organized or being uh, validated. But there's also a series of obstructions in what um, uh, is is being practiced. So uh, so so we uh, let's. I want to just only close with one. It's a bit of an outrageous story. Uh, it's, it will seem outrageous, and this is the story of Madhvi. I don't know how many of you know the story of Madhvi. Does anyone know the story of Madhvi? So Madhvi is the prince. You don't even you wouldn't have even heard of her because oh, Yayati jo hai na, he is supposed to have. Um, he is an interesting character. Now. We didn't know that he had a daughter, but the text produces uh, Madhvi as his daughter. Some, somewhere in the middle of the text, book five, uh, she appears, Madhvi appears. And she's extraordinary. Now, one of the other things that we should be talking about is that uh, the, uh, it's very important for the woman to have her, um, uh, she has to have a special if you have multiple partners, particularly, you have to have a special gift which makes you a virgin each time. And that, there are many stories of, of that kind. Huh? So I, but uh, Madhvi is interesting because Madhvi has this gift. Each time she has a relationship, she produces a child, she becomes a virgin again. So she's available to be, uh, to, to be remarried or to be, have a second relationship. And Madhavi is literally hawk because she's the daughter of Yayati. Yayati is being a grand king at some point because uh, he's got, he's been asked for a gift uh, uh, and he doesn't have the gift. So he said, I don't have the gift, but I'll give you this daughter and you can do with her. You can use her to get these 800 horses. And it's a complicated story. I won't go into it. But so yeah, 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 yeah the, the student, Galav, takes Madhavi and then literally places her in the in four kings of uh, three kings houses she produces a son each a chakravarti son each for each of those people and then she finally uh, uh, he still doesn't have the number of horses that he requires so he finally goes to uh, vishwamitra whom he has promised to give these horses and he says you take her and you have a, a child of her and then you will be able to uh, i mean i'll repay my gift my uh, uh, my debt to you as it were. And that's what happened. So she's, she has four sexual partners. She produces four kings of this, these relationships. At the end of which, she's taken back to Yayati and then he organizes a Swambara for her. How do you like that? So he organizes a Swambara for her, he bedecks her, takes her off, and they go to the uh, uh, land between the Ganga and the Yamuna. And she has been told to choose up. A number of kings have shown up. And she says, sorry, I don't want any of this. And she becomes, she says, I will choose the forest, the forest as my, uh, my partner. And so she basically turns her back on reproduction, on, on her duties as a, as a wife. And she turns it and she goes in that direction. Now, I actually find a very interesting uh, mode of resistance in this. That is. I'm not going to do this once more, okay? Even for you, my father, I'm not going to do it, uh, your gift. Uh, so on the one hand, Amba has resisted. And on the other hand, Madhvi in her own way, at the late in line, late in the storyline, in her storyline has also resisted. And both these were, and in the case of Madhvi, she actually reaches, far, uh, reaches the goal which men seek to, uh, gain that is a kind of heaven, and she gets it because her dharmic actions have been very strong. So she's uh, she's had these four sexual partners, but at the end of the day, 
she's chosen her own destiny and she said i'm not going to do anything more that you are asking me to do and i will choose my own destiny and her own destiny is to achieve the goal that she that other men have also sought to achieve so at the end of the day the the and i looked at this as that she's actually the reified boom i mean women are reified but actually it's not women who are reified it's their wombs that have been reified that is what you have to consider and she's gone beyond that to make her own challenge and or, or make her own uh, statement against being trapped in a body which is reduced to nothing but being a womb and a reproducer of chakravarti kings and so at the end of the day she to my mind actually resists in a kind of way which amba does not successfully do in her own lifetime she has to be reborn in order to get her uh, back so at Uh, so if you look at ultimately in the deep structure of the mahabharata you'll actually see that it is a lot around the politics of reproduction there is also then uh, a mode by which both women are reduced to their body and uh, who can in a sense exit from it and stand on their own firm ground and to my mind that's the interesting thing as i look at the politics of reproduction I mean, in a funny sort of way, people would say the Mahabharata is a story in which everyone is the son of his mother, nobody is the son of his father, and that's true. You know, along the story, you know, kis 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 ka baap kaun hai? So, samjh nahi aata hai. But so, you know, everyone got so. But here is a story in which ultimately you can see agency on the part of women and seeking to retrieve that agency. and to actually as part of same goals as everybody else that is dharmic goal and i get it she gives she gives she has so much merit she can give some to her father also and her father is a lafra baji if i was not wrong and he is not going here and there he comes back he can't go to heaven he can't stay there he comes back again and so on. and madhavi gives him her part of her merit in order to save him at the end of the day so she has got so much merit uh, self acquired at the end of the day that she is actually opt to snook at the Whole system, as, as I see it. So, on that note, I shall end. Thank you very much for that. I just want to quickly check if uh, if we have time to continue with it, or do we need to continue with the discussions? Uh, in in any case, there's food uh, and tea outside. You see. Uh, okay, I'm going to be short. Not so much. No, no. Uh, we can maybe take a few questions for now and continue afterwards over the questions. Uh, maybe about two to three questions. And I just wait a second. And there was a hand in uh, up in the back that you can. Thank you. Um, I'm the so I'm the director over here, the nutrition. And my question has to do with abductions. There's one abduction in the Mahabharata which is a reverse, right? Where the woman abducts the. And where does that fit into this? And who? I forget who that was. Was that Subhadra? Was it Abhimanyu who was abducted? By by uh, his uh, perspective, uh, the, the princess of uh, in the northeast. Is that what you're referring to? I'm actually quite sure. Uh, is that an abduction? There is one abduction for sure out of Krishna's lineage. So not Subhadra, but I thought it was. You mean this? Is it in your then the account of a boy abducted by the girl son? No, but the woman herself. Does the Krishna's grandson Anirudh was affected by it? Okay, okay. Well, yeah. Dr. Mai, uh, his his uh, prospective bride. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I didn't go down to Krishna's grandson. Right. I mean, it's Abhimanyu's son. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Then how did Krishna's grandson? Yeah. How did? Because they're not Krishna's grandson. Krishna's grandnephew. Yeah. 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 Great. 
Why does he 
use Raksha as a form of gaining uh, the bodies. And, uh, why, why can't we let it be? Why can't we do a regular relationship? You are looking at some place, I'm looking at another place. You need your daughter to be an idea. That's, that's not happening. So that's a question also. Why doesn't he do that? Why can't he? It's such, it's such a great dynasty, such a great. Uh, he could have actually negotiated most of the cases when you are negotiating. And there's a lot of give and take and there's a lot of political, um, what we call it, stakes in marriage. You know that marriage is not about, uh, not simply about why is love marriage so uh, problematic at the moment? You know? Why do you need to disrupt it all the time? Uh, how much violence there is there? So, in a sense, marriage existing as an aspect of society is heavily controlled and heavily, um, I see it as a very important part of the politics of our time, although we will never be given that, uh, that uh, importance. But at the end of the day, um, reproduction is as much a political issue as productions, as any other form of uh, we don't acknowledge it like that. That's unfortunate. At the end of the day, you have made the sexual division of labor, uh, or sexual division, that is, household is private, uh, public sphere is whatever it is. Everything is deeply political, and everything is tied to the last. You can't make these artificial divisions you know, between one sphere and another sphere. It's, uh, it's bad. Uh, understanding, bad analysis, it's bad conceptualization, and it's bad uh, uh, way in which you can tackle the problems of the, uh, even, I mean, understand your own society. So why do we put something in the gender is in one sphere and then politics is in the other sphere? Gender is very good. That's it. Just one small question, but I mean, so uh, in this case, uh, like uh, here, as you said, that class, class uh, gender, they are like, uh, they do it for them. So here in case, why specifically the reproductive uh, resources of certain class, like Shatayas here, why they are only really being uh, more in the norm? Like, is there something related to being something new there? <laughs> <laughs> is it good to have genes? Of no, in the original tradition, it's all only men with it, right? Sorry for something. No, I mean, uh, yes and no. Whether it's acknowledged or not, uh, why is marriage so deeply political? Whether it's the genetic substance or not, uh, you are the the politics of marriage uh, is as important as the politics of the That's my point at the end of the day. So, um, yeah. Um, what specifically was the point that you were raising? It's, uh, uh, it's the it's like, uh, it's the good genes being considered. Uh, good genes in the sense like uh, uh, many times when we go for marriages, hmm. many times we look into the what are the qualities of the women. Uh, you are now you're looking at disease. Yeah. 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 So, so women who have cancer, their children are like that. I mean, I'm not weird. Yeah. I'm good at classifying and uh, and saying bad, good, and uh, then organizing the, the dimension. Of course, I think that it's deeply. My point is that marriage and reproduction are it's very it's a kinship, but it's a very common problem. And now they're all seeing themselves and the chota chota the genitals and genetic code is terribly important. Okay, there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> yeah, there are two three questions. You don't have to decide, my dear. Why, why? I am in your hands. Uh, hello, I'm great talk. Uh, my question was you had spoke something specific like uh, polygamy is something to swallow the Vishatri are men specific, right? Uh, but in the case of Mahabharata, we also observe uh, feminine uh, characters like Kunti, Matri, uh, Draupadi, and also um, in the wives of uh, the wife of uh, the sons of Vidur. So all of them also followed polygamy, right? So do we say this wives. wife wife of the twin sons of Vidura? Yeah. So um no, my point was There's is no it evidence that Vidura's wife Vidur's uh, Vidur had uh, twin sons and yeah. uh, and they share the same uh, wife. Yeah. 
Okay, I do get that from. I'm not sure. I have, I have not read it. Sorry. Yeah. So my point being is, is it uh, I don't know, sexual expression and freedom, or is it like the women were treated as a commodity or a bit of both? See, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that there is this um, what's it called? There is a granting of agency, and then there is a subversion of the agency. That's my point about the swamaras. To take it in, the swamaras choice, right? And the woman is meant to be able to make her choice. To, to this day, people will say, Ah, Maya, so we already had swine marriage. We had girls had our marriages. We had everything in the past. So, love marriage is a uh, don't criticize us for whatever it is. But if you look at the structure, why is it that you're using, why are you, why are you disrupting the swine from happening? What's the politics of that? Why can't you, they would not be, obviously, they would not be chosen by. Those uh, princesses, there is desperation to get the wife, uh, get them, uh, get him uh, partners, and not, not one partner, but three. Three uh, on the safe side, okay. Uh, somehow the uh, reproduction should get there. That form is abducting from a swamra. Supposedly, it, it, that's also custom only for Shatriyas. But that is, that is also being obstructed. Rakshasa is also Shatya and uh, Sandra is also Shatya. What is interesting is to see that they are pitted against each other as possibilities. And ultimately, uh, you can't afford to grant the agency to them. It's not that they didn't do it because, like, as I said, Kunti chose uh, Sandra. Okay? Uh, but you know, uh, there are so many possibilities. But the uh, desperation to continue the lineage leads to certain forms of uh, practices which are interesting. So, in a sense, when you're talking about the politics of reproduction, you look at these things. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's not so uh, easy to actually organize the ordinary succession. You know the consequences of what happened. When these two, these two uh, chat and these two cousins are fighting away, you know, uh, sets of cousins are fighting away. Or that piece of marriage and production are related to kingdoms and inheritance and uh, forms of succession and so on. And, you know, uh, so it's very deeply political. That's the question. And in that situation, in the text itself, there is enough evidence to indicate that there are multiplicity of factors, but they are being also sought to be coded in a certain kind of way that they end finally in a more patriarchal and uh, way of organizing the reproduction in which the women have yeah, this. That's Good evening, ma'am. It's lovely to be in the class again. <laughs> uh, but I have an observation that may perhaps lead to a question about why abduction was justified and coming from Shreya Kepu's story where his father says that this is an old norm. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it is still a society in transition yeah, yeah. when uh -huh. they are kind of making way for Swayamvar mm -hmm. and also when we're talking about eight forms of marriages, they are in an order of preference. Yeah, yeah. While rapture of marriage is uh, accepted, it's still not the preferred form. Yeah, but what's interesting is that it is allowed to be Shakyas. Yeah. So my point, you see, they, at the end of the day, why they've got their own core forms yeah. and are there in India. Yeah. So in a sense, what's the relationship between the reproduction of political power and the eclectic way in which marriage production is permitted to the Shatriya. Okay, so that's really the question. It's not that it's happening across the board. And they don't care about the underclass and the basically the, the Vidura and his clan. They don't really care about that. Yeah, but it is also a question of control of power and you know how yeah, you are making ties. You have all kinds of resources. But, then, but, you, but you're not waiting to make those ties. You said you're abducting. Yeah. So you are actually not Raja would have been your uh, somebody. Yeah. He said, grab the daughters and take them away. So what are you doing over there? Now, this is an indication that 